Is there a power struggle going on right now? Who is in charge here in Haiti? I don't know if there is a power struggle. I'm not paying attention to whether or not there is a power struggle. I'm paying attention to uh, giving justice to President Jovenel Moïse. An emotional message from Haiti's interim prime minister tonight. Our Marcus Moore is in Haiti now. Just finished that conversation with the man leading the country right now, just days after the president of Haiti was assassinated. His message to the world tonight about Haiti's future, as there are still so many questions tonight about who was behind the killing and what comes next. The major shift by the CDC today, paving the way for massless learning in schools, why the move was made now, and what they hope to accomplish. Also tonight, confusion over the need for a booster shot against the Delta variant. Pfizer wants to provide one, but right now the CDC and FDA say not so fast. Tonight, the heat emergency in the West, the records that could be shattered in Las Vegas this weekend, and the unfathomable temperature in Death Valley could see 130 degrees. Tonight, residents in California being asked to cut down on electricity and water use. Rob Marciano breaks it down. The chilling new body camera video from January 6th showing the violent clashes between suspects and police. One suspect yelling at officers, you're all going to die tonight. The billionaire space race, Virgin Galactic's Richard Branson rushing onto the launch pad this weekend, hoping to soar into orbit about a week before Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin. The Spelling Bee champion making history, one more title to add to her impressive list of accomplishments. I've been like working on it for like two years and then to finally have it, it was, uh, it was really good. And it's a moment more than five decades in the making. No, it's beyond words. It's beyond words. Our team of foreign correspondents tap into the energy and the enthusiasm ahead of England's biggest soccer match in 55 years. Guys, I'm so excited for so many things. We've waited a long time for this. I know absolutely nothing about football. Uh, I, I feel passionately about it because I'm English. Good evening. I'm Byron Pitts in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin this Friday night with the move by the CDC today that could pave the way for a close to normal learning experience for many children when school starts this year. The CDC issued new guidelines today saying students, teachers and staff who are fully vaccinated will now need to wear, will not need to wear masks in school beginning this fall. The move in part to encourage more children to get vaccinated. This comes as there's confusion over possible booster shots to limit the spread of the Delta variant. Pfizer asking for the government's approval of a booster shot, but right now officials say that is not necessary. Our Kaylee Hartong leads us off tonight. The CDC is urging schools to open and return to in-person learning this fall, saying vaccinated students and teachers don't need to wear masks, but individuals 12 and older who aren't vaccinated should still wear them, which includes millions who are under 12 and can't get the vaccine yet. Unvaccinated children should learn at least three feet apart, but the CDC says spacing limitations should not stop schools from reopening. We've done a reevaluation of the science and the science has showed us that we know what works to help keep schools safe and open for the coming school year. The CDC guidance are just recommendations. It will ultimately be up to the school districts to make their own rules and decide whether to require proof of vaccination. Children under 12 still can't get a vaccine. Christian Garrido, a father of three, says his kids were just asking him today about rules for this fall. It's a little confusing. I have a nine year old and an 11 year old and they're not old enough to get shots yet. So we're still kind of like worried about them going back to school in person. Here in California, schools will keep requiring masks. But in Arizona, there's a ban on mask mandates in schools. And masks will be optional when Chandler Unified reopens in two weeks. With the Delta variant racing through under vaccinated areas, the CDC tracking COVID outbreaks at teen church camps in Illinois and Texas and an indoor gymnastics facility in Oklahoma. We are seeing some small clusters and larger outbreaks of COVID-19 in locations such as camps and community events where proper, hard-learned prevention strategies are not enforced and the virus is readily able to thrive. And tonight, there is growing confusion over the need for booster shots. Pfizer announcing it will ask the FDA to greenlight a third booster shot be given 6 to 12 months after the second dose for better protection against the Delta variant. But just hours later, the CDC and FDA pushing back, saying Americans who've been fully vaccinated do not need a booster shot at this time. 
Kaylee Hartong joins us now. And Kaylee, some teachers tonight are concerned about these new guidelines. Yeah, Byron, yeah, one teacher's union, the NEA, says that they want schools to require masks where unvaccinated individuals are present. So that puts them at odds with the governors of states like Arizona and Florida, where they say masks in schools should be optional. Most interesting to me today, speaking with one father who said it was actually his kids who were more concerned with the rules than he was. Mm. Byron. Kaylee Hartung, thanks so much. For more on these COVID developments, we bring in ABC News medical contributor, Dr. Darren Sutton. Docs, thanks so much for joining us this evening. Good evening. As an ER doctor, you've seen the devastation of COVID-19 up close. So do you think teachers and students can feel safe in a massless classroom this fall, particularly with the spread of the Delta variant? Well, good evening, Byron. I think that first I want to acknowledge that in-person learning for children and young adults is essential for social and academic development, but we want to get there with an abundance of caution and using safety as a priority. I think that these recommendations that have been given out by the CDC today are quite confusing, are not, unfortunately are going to leave the work of managing this global pandemic onto local school districts, which is a very tall task to accomplish. Doc, we're sure to see a patchwork of COVID rules in schools across the country. As Kaylee just mentioned, the CDC guidance is only a recommendation after all. So what advice would you give to all parents, regardless of the COVID precautions their schools adopt? Well, I personally, I personally believe that if you have not been vaccinated to wear masks, and that includes anyone above the age of two. Um, as far as for parents, my advice to them is to call your local school districts and find out the rules and make a plan. Find out what is the testing surveillance guidelines, what are the rules regarding isolation and quarantine, and also get vaccinated, making sure that everyone in your home is vaccinated so that if by chance that child brings COVID-19 home, it stops there. As Kaylee reported, Pfizer came out ahead of the FDA and the CDC on the potential need for a booster shot. Do you predict we'll all need to be getting booster shots at some point? At some point, yes, possibly. I have to say that because we're still waiting on more data to come in. But right now, no. Although we have gotten this information from Pfizer in terms of the antibody response and the response to a third dose or a booster vaccine, that has not translated to real world evidence as we have no indications that show us that the vaccines are proving to be ineffective. They're actually working quite well right now. And so there is no indication at this point currently to get a booster shot. And Doc, last question, do the Delta variant and the recent uptick in cases, should vaccinated people be around non-vaccinated people without a mask on? I put, well, it depends on your level of uh, caution. And I think it depends on your risk hesitancy and how, and how best you can mitigate those things. Personally, for me, if I'm around others who I don't know or who are unvaccinated, I think it's best to err on the side of safety and wear a mask. And if you're in a location in close contact with other people from different households to wear a mask, we know that this vaccine is proving to be effective, but nothing is 100 percent. And so I always ask my patients to err on the side of safety. Dr. Sutton, always grateful for your insights. Thank you. Thank you. FBI and DHS officials will be making their way to Haiti as soon as possible and aid in the ongoing chaos on the heels of the assassination of Haiti's president, the White House announced today. This after a total of 17 men, including two U.S. nationals, were arrested in connection with the murder. ABC's Marcus Moore is in the capital city of Port-au-Prince for us. Tonight, the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security dispatching senior officials to Haiti to help investigate the brutal assassination of President Jovenel Moise, the country in utter turmoil, the Haitian government requesting American troops to help keep the peace. The government officials here declaring a state of siege. They urge people to stay in their homes and to remain calm. And that is what we have seen here. This is a moment of calm, but the concern is that this city, Port-au-Prince, and this country could descend into chaos at any moment. Tonight, many questions remain about who killed the president and why. Nearly two dozen people are now under arrest, two seen here dragged by police through an angry crowd. Officials parading suspects in front of the cameras along with a large cache of weapons. Two are American citizens, James Solage and Joseph Vincent. A Haitian judge leading the investigation says the Americans claim they were only acting as translators for the assassins. I asked acting Prime Minister Claude Joseph about their role. They have said that they were only uh, merely translators um, in the midst of this, this operation um, and that they were set up. Um, is that true? Only the investigation can tell. President Moise's 
uh, murder has left um, a power vacuum here in, uh, in Haiti. And a lot of people um, the, in the international community in the United States um, are watching and wondering who's in charge here now. Um, is, there, is there a power struggle going on right now? Who is in charge here in Haiti? I don't know if there is a power struggle. I'm not paying attention to whether or not there is a power struggle. I'm paying attention to uh, giving justice to President Jovenel Moyes, uh, his family, his uh, wife, uh, son and daughters. The people are in shock. The people, myself, myself, I, I'm in shock because no one would ever think that President Jovenel Moïse will be killed, tortured in his own house. Nineteen suspects are from Colombia. The head of the Colombian police says they traveled into Haiti in two teams through the Dominican Republic. He said they were recruited, but wouldn't say who recruited them and why. They wanted him. They wanted to remove him. They wanted him to step down. And we can understand what is going on. But let me let the investigation uh, tell the truth. Do you, do you believe um, there's any possibility that this crime that was committed here in Haiti was an inside job? Listen, those foreign mercenaries couldn't just come on their own and kill the president. How can you be sure that you have the right people? We do have the right people, and they, they are under investigation. They're talking now. So we are going to give justice. Byron, there was a moment in that interview that we did with the acting prime minister where he became emotional. There were, there were tears in his eyes when he was talking about uh, the death of uh, President uh, Moise. And it really gives you a sense of, of how much pain there is for so many people here in, in Haiti. And um, he also acknowledged the, the difficult road ahead. But he uh, urged people to see the potential in this country. Uh, but you cannot deny the fact, Byron, that there is um, uh, what could be a power grab here. There's a power vacuum uh, with the death of the president. And uh, the, the question is, who will lead this country into the future? Um, it remains to be answered. But what the prime minister, the acting prime minister, said today is that he's not interested in power struggles. He's interested in getting this, uh, this country moving and supporting its, its people. Byron. Our thanks to Marcus. Now we move to the aftermath of the fast-moving tropical storm Elsa, which slammed the northeast today with heavy rains and winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. Drivers navigating through washed-out roads in Suffolk County, New York. Flood water is also rushing through downtown New Haven, Connecticut. Let's bring in our Rob Marciano. The threat from Elsa is mostly over, but Rob, now there could be more severe weather tonight, yes? Yeah, across much of the country, we've got a, some messy events behind Elsa, which m just ripped through here earlier today. The sun's obviously out, but the surf still very, very high uh, for Narragansett Beach. So this thing has been moving to the east and northeast at 30 miles per hour, so it's now over 100 miles east of Boston already. On the map, you kind of see the wraparound there is ending, but there's another threat for severe weather from New York, really down through D.C., Baltimore. Could see some rough storms tonight. St. Louis, Kansas City, Des Moines, that wide swath that cuts through Nebraska. Could see not just damaging wind, but the possibility for seeing uh, some uh, hail and tornadoes too, and I-10, also uh, some thunderstorms down across the Gulf Coast. But the heat really uh, is the other big headline that we're dealing with. Uh, another big heat wave building in the West. Look at all these excessive heat warnings that are posted across several states there. Uh, and this is dangerous stuff again with some big cities that will be threatening all-time uh, record highs with this thing really not peaking for a couple of days. Sacramento 112 tomorrow. Uh, Salt Lake City not peaking till Sunday or Monday with a high of over 100 degrees. And Las Vegas could very well tie or break an all-time record high of uh, 117 to 120. So this is uh, dangerous stuff again. This is like basically their third heat wave that they've seen. And we're just into July. Wow. Meyer. The heat, the storms, busy season for you, my friend. Thanks so much, Rob. You bet.
Tonight ahead of the extreme heat Rob just mentioned, California is worried about the strain to the power grid. And this comes after the hottest June on record in the West's third heat wave in just a matter of weeks. Residents are now being urged to cut down water usage by 15 percent. Matt Guppin reports. Tonight, that heat wave has California authorities announcing flex alerts over concerns about power failures. This, as the nation's most populous state, like much of the West, is mired in an historic drought. The governor declaring a state of emergency in 50 of 58 counties, asking folks to cut water use by 15 percent. Not only on residences, but industrial, commercial operations and agricultural. 95 percent of California is designated as in a severe drought. Last year, at this time, it was 21 percent. In Tulare County, wells running dry. From those taps, little or no water. You can't cool down, you can't take a proper shower, nothing. Across the West in Lake Powell in Utah, Lake Mead in Nevada, and Folsom Lake in California at record lows. Lake Piru is considered one of the best preserved lakes, but it's only at 20% capacity. And this is one of the main reservoirs here in Ventura County that uh, we rely on to do uh, much of the, of, of the work downstream. Fueling fires, this one roaring north of Sacramento, forcing new evacuations today. So far this year, wildfires burning more than twice the acreage of last year's record fire season. Matt Gutman joins us now. Matt, the lake behind you plays a critical role in fighting wildfires, but this year it may be more of a challenge than ever before for fire crews. A much bigger challenge, Byron. So um, just to give you a sense of where we are. We might have to make a, a little U-turn because we're getting a little close to the dock. But um, this is Lake Piru. It is at less than a fifth of its typical surface area. And often the water would be lapping up right where those trees are. That's, uh, I don't know, a quarter of a mile away. Uh, and because a lot of lakes and reservoirs have shrunk so significantly, it means that those firefighting aircraft, which are necessary in these mountainous areas uh, to fight fire, Fires can't really scoop up as much water. It means they can fly fewer missions. It means that they're flying heavier for longer. That costs more fuel and a lot more money. So it is going to be very challenging this year to fight uh, what firefighters say it's probably going to be the worst season in recorded history. So just a confluence of really terrible things happening. Drought, crazy dryness, and this remarkably low level of lakes and reservoirs here, Byron. Wow, challenging indeed. Matt Gutman, thank you so much. To the White House tonight, and amid new ransomware attacks based on Russia, President Biden, in a phone call to President Vladimir Putin today, warning the U.S. will take any necessary action to defend critical infrastructure. I want to bring in ABC's Rachel Scott. What more do we know, and is the White House finally going to take action? Mm -hmm. Well, Byron, the president making it very clear tonight that there will, in fact, be consequences for that latest cyber attack. A senior administration official says they will not telegraph what exact action they plan to take, but says that we can expect it to come in the coming days and weeks. Now, that phone call between the two leaders lasted for nearly an hour. I'm told the president delivered a very stern message that Russia must crack down on cyber criminals in its own country. But the Biden administration is not expecting things to change overnight. They know that this is going to take time, but the two sides, at the very least, Byron, are talking. Rachel Scott, thank you so much. Thanks. When we come back, the disturbing new video, the Capitol insurrection, shedding new light on that attack on our democracy. The latest on the billionaire race for space with Richard Branson's big flight set for this weekend. But up next, the building anxiety for some preparing to return to the office. Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. 
Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. Five, this is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people this squeezing this into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. More and more Americans are returning to daily life as COVID restrictions continue to be lifted across the country. But not everyone is eager to get back to pre-pandemic life. ABC's Faith Abube explains. Marnie Perez Ochoa's first flight since the start of the pandemic was a real lesson, a preview of just how much this 27-year-old can handle as the world emerges from a COVID slump. I felt really stressed. I booked my flight like off peak hours in the middle of the day when I knew there wasn't going to be a lot of people in the gate. I really felt like it was the most anxious I felt all day. Marnie is fully vaccinated, but after a year and a half of COVID lockdowns, more than 600,000 Americans dead from the virus and countless others living with lingering health problems, Marnie now sees crowds as a threat. Even the thought of going back to the office is giving her anxiety. I'm super nervous to go back. I like, it makes me have cold chills just even hearing you like, kind of talk about it. Obviously, I trust the vaccine. I obviously trust that I'm pretty safe. A recent poll suggests Marnie is potentially in the company of millions. More than half of Americans who responded say they are not ready to go back to pre-pandemic activities like bars, concerts, and large events. We have been seeing a lot of patients experiencing anxiety about what life is going to be like now, worries about is it okay to take off my mask now? Is it okay to go back indoors with friends to, I'm not sure, I remember how to socialize. Dr. Mimi Winsberg is a psychiatrist and the chief medical officer at Brightside, an online anxiety and depression treatment center. We talk about an adjustment disorder and psychiatry is a reaction to unusual circumstances that can result in anxiety or depression. We've established new habits and we're once again facing an adjustment as we reopen and get back to life as usual again. I never really thought that I would let fear or anything keep me from doing something, but it's kind of weird how that takes over your body. Marnie is slowly easing herself back into her routines, pushing herself one small task at a time, just like Dr. Winsberg prescribes for her patients. Don't get yourself to a point where you feel overwhelmed or exhausted, but do try to exercise that social muscle again. Anxiety is a normal symptom of daily life, but when we're unable to concentrate or enjoy our experiences with people, it becomes a problem. And there's no shame in seeking help. Our thanks to Faith. Still ahead here on Prime, the extraordinary move by the FDA to investigate itself over the agency's approval of an Alzheimer's drug, a substantial jump in the death toll in Surfside from that building collapse, and the miracle find. And why gay married people appear to be more financially successful than straight married people. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, Drake taking over a whole baseball stadium for a date. All right, here we go, you ready? Okay. 
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Okay. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. There once was a housewife. Erica Jean. A real housewife to Beverly Hills. Who married a hustler. Tom Girardi was L.A. Law. So powerful. They were just blowing money left and right. But then... The real housewife star accused with her husband of staging a fake divorce. Thomas Girardi accused of embezzlement. People love a good scandal. The biggest question is, did she know? The housewife and the hustler. Only on Hulu. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. There is no such thing as a bad dog. From the leader of the pack. I need you to be confident. Comes a serene new series. It's now or never. Season Milan, better human, better dog. New series, Friday, July 30th at 9 on National Geographic. I'm Dwayne Johnson. Hi, Dwayne Johnson, and I'm Emily Blunt. Get ready, because Monday morning on GMA, Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt will take you... On a wild adventure. Don't do that. ...and surprise one incredible and deserving dad. So are they ready for this epic surprise? Yes, we are. See it when it all happens live, Monday on ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. We turn now to a new study by the Pew Research Center that looked at the demographic differences between same-sex married couples and opposite-sex married couples. Here's what they found by the numbers. 50% of men in same-sex marriages have at least a bachelor's degree compared to just 38% of men in opposite-sex marriages. Men in same-sex marriages also have more money. $132,000 a year was their medium household income in 2019 compared to roughly $91,000 a year for opposite sex married couples. But the education income gap was smaller for women. 47% of women in same sex marriages have a bachelor's degree or higher versus 45% of their peers in opposite sex marriages. $101,000 a year is the medium household income for women in same sex marriages, which isn't far off from the roughly $91,000 of opposite sex couples. And finally, people in same sex couples are more likely to marry someone from a different race or ethnicity. 28% of men and 20% of women in same-sex marriages are intermarried, compared to just 16% of people in opposite-sex marriages. And we still have a ton to get to here on Prime. The billionaire sports owners allegedly avoiding paying their fair share of taxes. We speak with one of the authors behind a ProPublica investigation. An update on the Pope's health. And the basketball player who is now America's first black spelling bee winner. But first, look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. We will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Big hug, Richard. We taught all our patients how much they are loved. We hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. How big is the biggest shark fest ever? They're right here. It's six weeks big. It's more.
multiple places to watch big. That's a giant shark. It's Chris Hemsworth diving with sharks big. Should I be nervous? Oh, wow. With big action and even bigger premieres. Here's to the sharks. With a shark fest this big. You're going to need a bigger screen. The biggest shark fest ever. All week long on National Geographic and streaming on Disney+. Plus. This is one of those stories that as you cover it for years, it just becomes more unbelievable. 911. The truck fell on my stepson. His son dead. You wouldn't stand a chance. His first wife dead. Christina was trapped inside that bathroom. When this guy needed money, a family member would die. Now, his daughters speak out. And was he planning on killing again? What other reason would he have a life insurance policy out on one of his granddaughters? It's almost impossible to believe. The 2020 event, tonight at 9, 8 central on ABC. I'm Dwayne Johnson. Hi, Dwayne Johnson, and I'm Emily Blunt. Get ready, because Monday morning on GMA, Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt will take you on a wild adventure. Don't do that. And surprise one incredible and deserving dad. So are they ready for this epic surprise? Yes, we are. See it when it all happens live, Monday on ABC's Good Morning America. This is what being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. The CDC issued new guidance for fully vaccinated teachers and students heading into fall, saying they don't have to wear a mask. But they say those who are not vaccinated should keep wearing face coverings, stay three feet apart, and continue with COVID-19 testing. We're leaving the responsibility of managing a global pandemic up to local school districts, and we can do better than that. I recommend to my parents is continuing to, to proceed with an abundance of caution, advising that anyone who is not vaccinated to wear a mask, and of course, everyone at home who can get vaccinated to get vaccinated in order to prevent transmission of this virus. This development as the CDC faces a disagreement over booster shots with Pfizer as a new COVID variant is spreading across the country. The CDC and the FDA put out a pretty clear statement last night after the announcement by Pfizer, making clear that Americans who have been fully vaccinated do not need a booster shot at this time. Two weeks after the disaster in Surfside, Florida, rescue crews continue sifting through the rubble of the collapsed condo. The digging has gone on virtually nonstop since day one, and the pace of recoveries has accelerated. Tonight, the death toll climbs. At least 79 people have been recovered from the rubble. This is a staggering and heartbreaking number that affects all of us very, very deeply. Miami-Dade Mayor Daniela Levine Cava says 13 million pounds of debris has been removed from the site. Our detectives working to identify those who may have been recovered as quickly as possible so we can get accurate information. One small piece of good news today, crews pulled a cat out of the rubble alive. It has since been reunited with its family. The head of the FDA taking the extraordinary step of calling for a federal investigation into her own agency's approval of a controversial new Alzheimer's drug. Dr. Janet Woodcock is calling for a probe into contacts between FDA drug reviewers and the maker of the Alzheimer's medication. It is the latest fallout over the approval of the drug, which was given the green light by the FDA last month against the advice of its own outside experts. Guidelines for the drug were revised just yesterday. The Vatican says Pope Francis is walking, working, and has celebrated Mass at the Roma Hospital where he's recovering from scheduled intestinal surgery. All things seem to be going in the right direction, but you know, whenever someone in their 80s undergoes a major surgery like this and stays in the hospital, there's always a lot of concern. So they're keeping a close eye on him, and the Vatican did confirm he will be in the hospital through the weekend. But again, that bit of good news, they also confirmed he will be delivering those prayers on Sunday. We could potentially see Pope Francis on Sunday from his hospital at the window delivering that prayer. But there also is sort of a new precedent. You know, under COVID, uh, Pope Francis gave many uh, prayers and blessing streaming online. So we could see something like that. Daila Avangar. 
History at the National Spelling Bee, Zaila Avant-Garde became the first African-American to be crowned spelling champion. Maria, M-U-R-R-A-Y-A. That is correct. <laughs> I felt like really good to like be, become a winner simply because of the fact that I've been like working on it for like two years and then to finally have it uh, like the best possible outcome was uh, it was really good. Scripps National Spelling Bee winner, Zahila Avant-Garde. And how about making history the first African-American champion? That feels really good, too, because I'm hoping that in a few years, I'll see a whole lot more African-American females and males, too, uh, doing well in the script spelling bee, because it's kind of sad how there's like a, a great lack of those people. You don't really see too many African-Americans doing too well in spelling bees, and that's a bit sad, because it's like a really good thing that kind of is a good gate opener to being interested in education. And there is your champ, the holder of three Guinness World Records, and now the 2021 Scripps National Spelling Bee winner. Good for her. Changing gears. You're going to die tonight. Those were the words shouted at some officers during the January 6th insurrection. In newly released videos, we get more of a look into the vile attack on our nation's capital. ABC's Pierre Thomas brings us this report. Tonight, graphic new videos showing just how vicious the threat was that officers faced defending the Capitol January 6th. You're going to die tonight. New footage from police body cameras showing the utter fury unleashed on officers on the steps of the Capitol as they protected a key entrance. Officers beaten as they fought off the mob. In this video, one officer knocked off his feet, the mob preparing to drag him into the crowd. Another officer seen here lying face down, surrounded, being beaten with a baton, and some of the most violent imagery yet from the insurrection. Authorities arresting more than 500 suspects, on average three per day, since the January 6th assault. And the investigation far from over. The FBI is seeking more than 300 still-to-be-identified rioters, including more than 200 who assaulted officers. Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, what's the latest on the bipartisan select committee that will be investigating the insurrection? Biden, when the House Select Committee begins hearings in two weeks, among the first people they're going to have as witnesses, Capitol Police officers attacked that terrible day. Pierre Thomas, thanks so much. Pleasure. Some big help could be on the way for the hearing impaired. The National Institutes of Health says nearly 29 million people in the U.S. could benefit from hearing aids, and soon it could become much easier for the public to get them. Here's ABC's Rebecca Jarvis with the details. Two years ago, around her 18th birthday, Dariana Noyola started having hearing issues. I feel like I am swimming underwater constantly. I can never hear properly. Doctors said she had 30% hearing loss. Now it's nearly 50%, and it took more than a year to get hearing aids. I need my ears. I need to listen. I love to listen to people. Dariana is one of 48 million people in the U.S. with hearing loss, and while she receives state assistance through Medicaid, for millions of others, like 20-year-old Eliza Peters, private insurance doesn't always cover the cost. What I had to learn was how to be responsible with them, how to take care of them, um, and to realize that they're not cheap at all, and and the insurance doesn't pay for them. Cost is definitely a factor when it comes to individuals purchasing hearing aids who need them in order to hear better. A pair of hearing aids can cost anywhere from $5,000 for a pair and up. Now, President Biden issuing a new executive order to help people with extreme hearing loss, directing the Department of Health and Human Services to issue plans to combat price gouging on typically costly hearing aids within 45 days and take action within 120 days to propose getting these available over the counter. The price is going to come down from, in some cases, several thousand dollars to a few hundred dollars. So this is going to be real money 
back in the pockets of folks uh, who need to use hearing aids. And for Eliza, that means breathing easier as she starts a new chapter in her life. The next time I'll get them, I'll probably be 26, 27. I'll be graduated from college. I'll have a job and it'll be on me. And that barrier of the financial side of everything is about to be blown up if we can see some change in the policy. Now to the billionaire space race. Richard Branson just days away from making history while Jeff Bezos gets ready for his own launch. Gio Benitez has the details of the preparations. Just two days away from that historic launch to the edge of the atmosphere, Richard Branson set to beat Amazon founder Jeff Bezos by just nine days in what's been dubbed the billionaire space race. Branson speaking with GMA right after breaking that news. I know that it's been painted as a race. Honestly, I don't think either of us see it that way. We're not really in direct competition. The two launches will look very different. The Bezos Blue Origin launch looks more traditional, a rocket launching upright with a space capsule above it. But the Branson launch Sunday will start just like a typical planes liftoff. The mothership, the VMS Eve, named after Branson's mom, will carry the Unity spaceship underneath it. Once they reach 45,000 feet, Eve drops the spaceship. Within seconds, the rocket ignites, shooting them to the edge of space. Fire. Fire. While neither Branson nor Bezos will reach the Earth's orbit, Bezos will go a little farther, 62 miles above the surface versus Branson's 55 miles. I'm just expecting the most extraordinary uh, trip of my lifetime. Five other Virgin employees will join Branson for the company's first fully crewed flight. The world, and even those off it, will be watching. ABC News speaking with astronauts aboard the International Space Station just days ago. Well, everybody says it's not a race. I think, I think it's good. I think you need some momentum. You need, uh, and uh, you know, being competitive is kind of part of the part of the process. And it comes with a risk. In 2014, Virgin Galactic lost one of its pilots during one of the company's test flights. The spacecraft broke apart and crashed in the Mojave Desert. Some uh, painful moments in the last 17 years. Some wonderful moments, um, but it's been 17 years of hard work. Our thanks to Geo. Former Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer made news this week when Fortune magazine announced that with a net worth of more than $100 billion, he's now the ninth person on the world to reach that elite group. Ballmer is also part of another elite group. He's the owner of a professional sports team, the LA Clippers. You think that with all of that money, Ballmer would be paying a lot of federal taxes, but according to a report by ProPublica, Ballmer and some other team owners actually pay far less than most Americans and it's perfectly legal. Joining us now is ProPublica data reporter Ellis Simani to explain how it all works. Thank you so much for joining us, Ellis. Thanks for having me. Your article starts off by comparing the 2018 tax returns of three people, all connected to sports, a concession stand worker at the Staples Center, NBA star LeBron James, and LA Clippers owner Steve Ballmer. Explain. Yeah, you know, so we we took a look at a few different people. One of them, as you mentioned, was Mr. Ballmer. Um, and let's start in 2018. So in 2018, Steve Ballmer reported more than $650 million in income, and he paid a federal income tax of about 12% on that. And and stepping back and taking a look at a, at a concession worker at Staples Center that we looked at in our story, um, she made about $45,000, but paid 14%. And so, you know, Steve Ballmer made more than $15,000 15,000 times more than she did, but paid uh, a lower federal tax rate, which, you know, really, um, you know, kind of kind of cast doubt on the idea that we have a progressive tax system in which as you make more money, you pay a higher percentage of your of your income in federal income tax. Steve Ballmer told ABC News he's always paid the taxes he owes and has publicly noted that he would personally be fine with paying more. But this isn't just Clippers owner Steve Ballmer. You obtained the 2018 tax returns for a bunch of pro sports team owners. How do they manage to pay so little in taxes? Yeah, so you know how I like to think about it is this way. If I buy a business, I'm often able to uh, deduct almost the entire purchase price of that business um, against other income I own. And mm -hmm. the, the underlying theory behind this is that the purchase price of a business is composed of assets that are kind of degrading over time. So think of things like factory equipment, buildings, cars. Um, and so in order to recover those costs, you're able to deduct um, that, that, that those, those, uh, 
that money against other income you might earn. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, you know, the thing that gets kind of wonky about it is that with sports teams, the purchase price is actually composed of things like player contracts, uh, media deals and other TV deals that are actually appreciating in value. And so, you know, team owners and these billionaires are able to, uh, you know, amount, uh, tell the government that they're actually losing money from these teams, you know, even if they're actually generating millions of dollars of profit. Wow. How did the system get this way, allowing tax deductions for sports teams that appear to be making money? Yeah, you know, so we got we went back and found that, you know, the IRS and sports owners have actually been, you know, in battle for decades going back to the mid 20th century. Uh, you know, one one kind of character we looked at was Bill Veck. Um, who was the former owner of the Cleveland Indians back in the 40s. And he's kind of famous for this quip saying, you know, um, we play the Star Spangled Banner before every game you want us to pay income taxes to. And, you know, that really that really sums him up, sums him up pretty well. He's really well known for uh, kind of pioneering this move where team owners are not only able to expense player contracts, you know, but they're also able um, through the same kind of process I mentioned uh, to claim a loss, a second loss, uh, based off of the, uh, the 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 player contracts that in the, in the portion of the purchase price um, that was amounted to them, and you know, in, in present day under the the Bush administration, that really just expanded to where team owners are not only able to claim tax losses based off of uh, the player contracts, but also media deals and other things that are actually appreciating in value, you know, thus giving them the ability to you know write off a, a number of expenses. Is, um, you know, while they're generating money at times. Ellis, you write that the savviest tax play for billionaires is owning a pro football team. Why is that? Yeah, so, you know, football teams in the NFL, they have among the highest TV ratings of the four major North American sports leagues. And how it works in the NFL is that every team gets a piece of that pie. And so these multi-billion dollar TV deals are very lucrative and almost guarantee that, you know, teams will end up being profitable at the end of the day. And, you know, we looked specifically at the um, Carolina Panthers, formerly owned by Jerry Richardson. And we found that um, in, within our tax information that Richardson, you know, was generally profitable in later years, at least in terms of what he was reporting to the to the IRS. But in 2017, he sold the team to another billionaire, uh, David Tepper. And what we found was that Tepper was, you know, then reporting to the IRS that the team was lo was losing money. Um, and, you know, the only re really way to account for this, because there was no, in, in, you know, in a real world sense, any major difference in terms of the, you know, the team's, you know, finances or anything of that nature was that, you know, amortization and the ability for teams to claim these massive of losses, uh, you know, because of this tax break. Finally, we want to emphasize that all these tax deductions are perfectly legal under the existing federal tax code. But until a new tax bill is passed, is there anything that the IRS can do about this? Right. So, you know, we, we, we reached out to several owners, you know, many of whom said, you know, they pay the taxes they owe. And, and, you know, we aren't alleging that any of the owners did anything illegal here. You know, the tax code allows for them to claim these losses. And until that changes, you know, we can expect that team owners will continue, you know, to turn what might be a profitable business on paper into a loss. And, you know, and with that, save millions of dollars in taxes. That's ultimately costing the taxpayers. The spokesman for former Carolina Panthers owner Jerry Richardson declined to comment, as did the current owner, David Tepper. The article on ProPublica.com is The Billionaire Playbook, How Sports Owners Use Their Teams to Avoid Millions in Taxes. Ellis Simani, thank you again for joining us. Great to be here. With so many people vaccinated and traveling again, we take a journey to a beautiful part of the country with an incredible coastline where people help each other during the good times and the bad. Ginger Z has more. From the sun rising over Turnip Rock to the majestic northern lights over the Mackinac Bridge, Michigan is full of wonder. This state, by the way, has 3,000 miles of freshwater shoreline, the most in the U.S., and they are all peppered by these gorgeous piers, the historic lighthouses. This one has been here since 1839, so it really only made sense that we start our Michigan adventure here.
Up the pristine shoreline, where this time of year, tens of thousands of acres turn bright red. Michigan is the number one producer of tart cherries in the nation. All these little guys grow here so well because of Lake Michigan and the sand. Barbara Bull's family has owned the farm for more than 70 years. Light sandy loam soils, rolling terrain for good air drainage, and the proximity to the lake that protects us from frost. But not every season is perfect, especially when layered with a pandemic. The crop is light or the crop is thin. And that happens because? Of the frost in April. Can I pick one? Of course you may pick one. As yeah. farmers, we're accustomed to uncertainty. That's part of our lifestyle. That's the one. And it is not just cherries. When you get to this northern part of the state, the rolling hills erupt in endless vineyards. Michigan happens to be one of the top 10 wine producers in the United States. And guess what? The wine likes the sand too. Woo! This may look like a Star Wars set or the desert, but it is not. These are the Silver Lake sand dunes cut by the glaciers. The Great Lakes left behind all of these beautiful hills of sand. And we got a wild ride. And people are just shocked, like, this is Michigan. Oh, <laughs> I thought we went to the Sahara now or something. And, you know, they always ask, like, is there camels out here? Garrett is the fourth generation whipping adventurers around his family-owned business called Mac Woods Dune Rides here in Mears, Michigan. The popular attraction takes you on a seven-mile exhilarating expedition. And it lost a quarter of their 2020 season thanks to the pandemic. As the summer went on, we started getting a little busier and busier. And now that we're open this year, we've really seen a huge bounce back and people have just been coming out in waves this year. From some of those lesser known gems to Detroit, where Janet Abdenor Dabney had relied on in-person art exhibits to sell her jam cat candles. But when COVID-19 started, the flame went out and Janet needed a pivot. And here's how I make your candle especially for you. Taking online tutorials, she moved to social media, using her Instagram to show just how she makes her candles. And in the last year, sales boomed by 2,000%. It's no wonder why we rise and shine in Michigan's ray of light. Who knew? Our thanks to Ginger. When we come back, England versus Italy. Lots of drama, lots of tension, and some confusion over what's the fuss? Stay with us. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it.
This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. And finally tonight, ahead of a massive soccer match across the pond in the entire country of England, has their hearts on their sleeves, hoping this time will be different. The English national team is in a major championship final for the first time, get this, in 55 years. And the country gets to play host to the big game this weekend against Italy. Maggie Ruley has more on why the game is so important. A special conversation with two fans you might just recognize. Scores brilliantly, and Denmark lead. England fight back. Virginity to the ball. It's pandemonium in Italy and England. Bedlam at Wembley. Both teams punching their ticket to the Euro Championship final. Forza Italia. Italy are in the Euro 2020 final. For England, this moment is more than five decades in the making. No, it's beyond words. It's beyond words. It's coming home. Not since 1966, before many of us were even born, has England ever made it to a major soccer championship final. Harry Kane sealing England's fate in Wednesday's semifinals against Denmark. And now on Sunday, this team has the chance to win the Euro Championship final on their home turf. And for England, this is epic. They're the founding father of soccer, or football as most of the world calls it. And millions are hoping that their time has finally come to bring it home. It's coming home, it's coming. It's football. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so I still need to learn some things, but this humble American living in England has had a crash course on the world's most popular sport. <laughs> Fun fact, I learned the Euros are played every four years. It pits the best of the best from each nation in Europe against each other, and every country takes it very seriously. The excitement in England is contagious, just impossible to escape. The nation of 55 million rallying around their love for the sport. It's coming on. From superstar Adele. Oh, no! yeah! Yeah! To, of course, my two British colleagues, Ian Panel and James Longman. Guys, I'm so excited for so many things. One, the fact that we're all together right now, obviously it's online, but we have James in London, we have Ian on vacation in Mallorca, we have, I'm in Rome, yet here we are coming together to talk about one thing, and that's football. How do we feel? As an England fan, as someone who was born in 1966, yes, that's the last time we actually won a major tournament. Um, we've waited a long time for this, so yeah, it's good, it's good. I know absolutely nothing about football. Uh, I feel passionately about it because I'm English and, and it's nice that we're in, the, we're in the final. But you and I watched together, Maggie, and all I was doing really was screaming, put the ball in the goal. I'm not really knowing what else. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing standing in the way of an English victory, a very formidable Italian team. But here's the thing, as bad as England wants it, Italy wants it just as bad. And whether you're a fan or not, come Sunday night, everyone, probably most of them, here in Rome and across the country are all going to be glued to that game. Winning against Spain in the semifinals this week, this will be Italy's fourth time in the Euro final. But here in Rome, Italians seem confident. Do you think that England is a good challenge? Or are you pretty confident it's that England... It's the best challenge we could yeah. have had, yeah. Really? Especially on, on their soil, I think it's uh. the best challenge we could have had. I, and going into Wembley for the final, I think it's everything's just perfect. <laughs> you want to steal it from it's them on their It's going to be a big turn. upset for them, yes. <laughs> 
Giovanni Poggi has owned the bar La Botticella for 30 years. You know, the other night when the game was on and it went into penalty kicks and there was, I saw so much energy on the streets. What was it like for you to have your bar packed again? It was great. It was great. Around the world, people are coming together again to cheer on their countries. And Europe isn't the only continent with a high stakes tournament happening right now. Underway. Two of the world's most successful soccer teams, Argentina and Brazil, will face off this Saturday in the Copa America final for what's sure to be a nail biter of a game. And as soccer fans know, the win is about more than just a game. On Sunday, for the first time in a generation, all English eyes and hearts will be on the final in Wembley. Obviously, I've been living in England now for two years. I'm a hardcore English fan. I was cheering on Wednesday. Um, I know this chant now, but I don't know. Italy's really looking good on me, I think. <laughs> um, that, that, is, that is treacherous talk. That is treacherous talk. And remember, this goes out on television, Maggie. So English people will see this. And then when you come back to Britain, you won't be welcome. There'll be a grim airport hotel waiting for you. <laughs> well, Ian, for my sake, I hope you can finally see your team win. Maggie Ruley in Rome for ABC News. Our thanks to Maggie. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. Capitol Police staff remove area closed signs as they prepare to take down the remaining fencing that was put up around the Capitol after the insurrection. Access to certain areas will now be restricted using bike racks. Well, that's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis on today's top stories. I'm Byron Pitts. Thanks for streaming with us.